Richard Medhurst is not just any journalist, not just any broadcaster. He is one of the brightest and the best. And he joins me now for a chat about NATO. Uh, Richard, thank you uh, for doing that. Let me start with, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. At least we now have full spectrum affirmation uh, that an occupied people have the absolute right to take up arms against their occupier. Now, that'll come as a bit of a relief uh, to all those who have been called terrorists up to now for resisting their occupier, won't it? Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure Hamas and uh, Hezbollah and uh, all the oppressed people of the global south are, are you know, they're, they're just so happy and, and grateful to hear uh, you know, our foreign secretary, Liz Truss, uh, Secretary uh, Blinken, and, you know, most of the Western world just finally affirming the right to resist under international law. It's really funny, right, um, how the tables turn. And you've been seeing people also online fundraising for the uh, Ukrainian military effort. I think the Ukrainian embassy in the Czech Republic even posted a, a crowdfunding, uh, um, a link where people can go and donate to crowdfund military equipment for, uh, for the Ukrainians. I, I can assure you one thing, George, if, if either you or I posted a crowdfunding link for uh, uh, Syrians or Palestinians or Lebanese uh, to resist the foreign, uh, the U.S. foreign occupation or the Israeli occupation, we, we'd probably end up in Belmarsh prison or something along those lines. So it, it's is, really uh, it is a stunning contradiction that, as is the, uh, I mean, the, the uh, absolute unacceptability of acquiring other people's territory by force uh, is a clear principle of international law. Uh, and when you add the absolutely illegal alteration of the demography and the topography of the territory that you have illegally occupied by force, you have a double whammy of international illegality. And yet that's been happening in Palestine for the last 54, 55 years. How can people not see that what they're saying about Ukraine absolutely contradicts what they're doing in Palestine? Yeah, it really is a double whammy. That's, that's really the way to put it. You know, they're, they're violating the uh, uh, territorial integrity of Syria, uh, of the of Palestine, of Lebanon, and at the same time, as you said, altering the demographics. So it's ethnic cleansing. Let, let, let's put it very simply: it's ethnic cleansing. When you're moving, you know, one population out, you're depopulating an area of its native inhabitants, and then repopulating it with others. And this was—I'm sure you've seen this, George. This was absolutely hilarious. You had people in in uh, in Israel, you know, in occupied Palestine, protesting against Russia's occupation of Ukraine while they're standing on occupied Palestinian land. You can't make this up. You really can't make this no. up. Uh, and it, it, it's really it's really disgusting, the, the double standards, because we saw Don Donald Trump, he recognized Syria's Golan Heights as Israeli, uh, violating God knows how many UN Security Council resolutions, uh, you know, 242 to begin with. And then, of course, the Biden administration comes in. And you think they reverse that? Of course not. So they, they continue to regard Syria's Golan Heights as Israeli, violating, uh, uh, you know, Syria's sovereignty. But apparently territorial integrity, that's not a problem when you do it to, uh, you know, when you violate the territorial integrity of countries in the global south. They don't matter for some reason. Well, the blood of some people is very obviously more valuable than the blood of others. In fact, again, one of the silver linings in this really uh, lamentable situation we're now in is the admission of that on television. Uh, we had a CBS reporter uh, in situ and two nodding dogs in the studio uh, in which the reporter explicitly states that this is not Africa or Asia, this is a civilized European country, civilized, civilized Europeans. We had uh, another fellow on saying it was all so difficult to bear because the people have got blonde hair and blue eyes. They're not even hiding it anymore, Richard. 
Yeah, yeah. Th those were the exact examples that came to mind. It's really horrifying, George. They're, re they're really not even trying to, to hide their, their racism and their prejudice. I mean, to, to say that Iraq, uh, I mean, to say that about any nation, that they're not civilized is already insulting enough. But to say about Iraq specifically, right. the cradle of civilization, the one and only, I mean, th this just, it, it's just, it beggars belief. The ignorance is astounding. You know, only a brute could say such a thing. Richard, uh, Richard, and, Iraq had the world's biggest library when yep. Europeans were painting their faces blue and living in the forest. Fact. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's true. That reminds me of that quote from Lawrence of Arabia, right? He tells them that the Arab city of uh, uh, Cordoba had two miles of public lighting when London was a village. It's true. You know, we, we can't deny this and, and to deny history and, and, and just, you know, violate people's dignity like that. I think it's really insulting. You know, people should be uh, we should respect people's uh, uh, right to resist or just their right to seek refuge, whether they're from Afghanistan or Iraq or elsewhere, uh, regardless what color their their eyes and hair are. I mean, this is, uh, you know, I shouldn't have to spell this out, but this is where we're at. Right. And they're not even trying to hide it. No. Um, now, let's uh, let's turn to the current situation now. Um, I, I usually understand what's going on, but I don't understand this particular part. Under, uh, uh, in 1995, NATO made clear in writing uh, that nobody can join NATO if they have a pre-existing territorial dispute with their neighbor. Ergo, neither Georgia nor Ukraine can join NATO. Why didn't NATO just say that? That actually, much as we'd like to, neither Georgia nor Ukraine can join NATO because they don't fit the rules, the criteria. One has a territorial dispute uh, with uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. The other has a territorial dispute with Russia and therefore it cannot join NATO. If they'd said that, there wouldn't be a war now. Yeah, absolutely, George. You know, it's it's really interesting how they're willing to apply the NATO rules, uh, you know, it just uh, uh, on a whim, uh, you know, it's just random. They say, for example, that uh, Russia has no right to demand that Ukraine um, uh, forswear NATO membership. Uh, because they have an open door policy, right? They say that's enshrined in, in NATO's uh, uh, founding and, and it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's rule book. And yet at the same time, uh, when it comes to other rules, like the one you just mentioned, where you're not allowed to join NATO if you have pre-existing uh, disputes or territorial uh, disputes, because that would obviously bring security concerns for NATO, they don't seem to mind. You know, it's, uh, it's really interesting. And it, it's very obvious what's going on. What, what, what astounds me is that people want to talk about Ukraine, Russia, and and act like it's happening in a vacuum. They just want to remove all the geopolitical context. You can't do that. The CIA don't operate like that. NATO doesn't operate like that. They only operate in terms of geopolitics. So they know very well what they're doing. They've broken their promise in the two plus four negotiations not to expand eastwards. They've been going, you know, every couple of years, adding another country, another country. Now you've got 14 since 1990 who've joined NATO. You have five countries bordering Russia and they want to add the sixth. And, and of course, this would, was going to provoke the Russians. I mean, they want the United to have the States sixth, the words. biggest one of all. Ukraine is the second biggest country in Europe. And right. they really expect Russia to allow it to join NATO and move NATO missiles and forces and troops uh, into its territory on the border of Russia. We've given the history of Russia, twice invaded from the West through Ukraine, by Napoleon and Hitler, and the 26 million dead bodies that Russia had to sacrifice in order to defeat the latter invasion, you'd have to be insane to think the Russians were crazy enough to agree to that. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, don't, don't get me wrong, uh, uh, you know, we did a lot in the UK. Uh, my, my grandfather was RAF. I'm sure you, your parents were also involved in, in, in the war effort, George. And uh, the Americans did as well. But we cannot forget the Russians. They've really sacrificed the most. You've got 20 to 30 million uh, people dead, most of them civilians. And, you know, we shouldn't forget the Russians inflicted 80 percent of all German casualties. They, they really bore the brunt um, uh, of this war. 
and not, that's not to say no one else did, but they really sacrificed the most. And that has to be taken into, into account. You can't just um, act like it's, it's irrelevant. They have a very, very big issue and an ax to grind with Nazis, understandably so. And especially coming in from Ukraine while financing, like the CIA is doing financing neo-Nazis. I mean, the stuff they're posting on Twitter now, you should see the Ukrainian National Guard just a few hours ago on Twitter. They're posting that they're greasing the bullets in pig fat to shoot Muslims from Chechnya with. You know, they, they, they just openly advocate the, the racism, the neo-Nazi uh, policies that they have. And people expect us to forget that and forget Russia's history. No, I mean, this is, uh, it's, it's unreasonable for us, never mind uh, what the Russians uh, see it as. And I think if, if the US or UK were being surrounded by an adversarial military uh, alliance, we would probably do even worse. We would have invaded already much, uh, you know, um, uh, much earlier. Uh, the uh, subject uh, immediately suggests itself. We're supposed to hate Russia and love Germany. Uh, when in the lifetime of uh, some people still alive today, uh, it was, of course, the opposite. Germany has ripped up its pacifist uh, pretensions. It has now uh, basically joined the war. Uh, it has uh, stepped up massive and deadly weapons supplies to a country that is fighting Russia, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, I have a very hard line about Germany. I, d I believe it should have been divided. In fact, divided more than in two pieces. It should have been demilitarized and should still be demilitarized. But call me old fashioned. What's going to happen now? Because Russia is taking these almost hourly declarations of war from its Western adversaries very seriously indeed, whether economic warfare, which they like to call sanctions, it's a nice word, but it's economic warfare, just like a siege in, uh, in historical terms was economic warfare. Uh, and now uh, the pumping in of more and more and more weapons into Ukraine. We could very well be heading for a big war here. Yeah, it's absolutely reckless, uh, George. You know, the, the Germans, as you said, they've, they've supposedly been towing a, a, a neutral uh, line. Although we must say their weapons have been ending up in Saudi Arabia mysteriously, you know, killing uh, uh, Yemenis. But now they've come out in the open and they're saying that they're gonna, I think it was 2% of the, the budget is gonna go now towards uh, uh, armaments and they're just gonna openly uh, you know, send weapons to, to fight Russia, to give them to the Ukrainians. I mean, this is really playing with fire because we shouldn't forget that while they're, they're issuing these hourly declarations, as you meant, against Russia, you know, banning, uh, so issuing, putting sanctions on Lavrov and Putin and then banning Russian banks and then banning you and I as well from the airwaves. Uh, at the same time, Russia's not laughing because they're gonna, you know, they can easily just turn off the gas valves and then who's gonna freeze? It's, it's uh, certainly uh, well, I Germany think they should. and the rest uh, of Europe. I, I, I'm absolutely clear about that. I don't speak for Russia. I, I, I think that Russia should say that there's no more gas. Sling your hook, we'll sell it somewhere else. And you can freeze, or you can pay 10 times the amount you're currently paying for gas. I mean, freezing the assets in the central bank of a nuclear superpower, a member of the Security Council of the United Nations, the victor of World War II, are you serious? That's an act of war. It is. It is. Sanctions are war. It's, it's no different from, you know, in the Middle Ages when you're, you're besieging a city and starving the people out. We need to, we need to be very clear on that. I don't know if, if Russia is going to end up in the same situation as Iran or Cuba or Venezuela or Syria, but it's no joke. And they, if people who think that Putin and, and Lavrov are the ones who are going to suffer are, are, are sorely mistaken. It, it is a declaration of war. And, and the fact people can't see that and they, they can't appreciate the gravity of the situation is, is in big part what's, what's contributing to this, uh, to this conflict. Because they think that, that, you know, it's all about Putin's personality. No, 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 this is very serious what's happening. You know, as you said, it's a World War II victor, a nuclear power. Imagine if someone did that to the US. As a matter of fact, why didn't they do that to the US after Iraq? I mean, we're seeing just disproportionate uh, responses to Russia. 
uh, for something that pales in comparison to what, what the U.S. and U.K. did invading Afghanistan, invading Iraq, bombing Libya to smithereens, destroying Syria. If, if that's how we treat aggressors, then, then the U.S. and U.K. should be drowning in sanctions since 25 years. But that didn't happen. And this is a clear, clear double standard. And, and people are just refusing to wake up. They think this is a game. It's not a game. And ironically, the people who are going to pay the price are mostly the Europeans. The Americans are not going to freeze if Russia turns off the gas. It's the Europeans. You know, the Americans will probably make money for it, from it selling uh, liquefied natural gas. So they, they're sending Ukrainians, uh, uh, sacrificing them as, the, uh, as a, you know, using them as a sacrificial lamb. They're sending the Europeans off to the slaughter. And they're, of course, sitting in the back, uh, uh, you know, r clasping their hands together and wondering how they can further antagonize Russia and the global south. And it's not going to end well, George. No, uh, I see that today, uh, or yesterday rather, France seized a Russian ship uh, in an act of piracy in the English Channel. Yep. Anybody think Russia's going to take these kind of things lying down? No. Uh, I, can, I can remind you what happened. Uh, I'm sure you'll recall when uh, we seized an Iranian ship in Gibraltar. Yes. The Iranians immediately went and seized a British ship. And then, of course, we we're, were hearing screams about, oh, it's... it's uh, it's unfair, and why are they doing this to us? We, we, we do piracy to others all the time. Uh, the US has been stealing Iranian fuel ships headed to Venezuela and then selling off the oil. I mean, th this is literally by definition state piracy. And then if you think the Russians are not gonna react to this, wow, you're sorely mistaken. I think the Russians, you know, you're poking a sleeping bear. When that bear really wakes up, it's not gonna, it's gonna be very ugly. Uh, and people are gonna be in for a shock. I agree. Richard Medhurst, thank you as always. Uh, wonderful.